All right, shall we get rolling? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Good morning. Good morning. Wake up. All right, so uh, in the back, can you hear me okay? All right, so a few pro tips about this room. The back of the room is terrible. When this room is filled with people, it blocks the sound. That's science. Okay, so if you're sitting in the back, you're going to be at an auditory disadvantage to sitting closer to the front. Now, obviously, not everybody can sit in the front row, but if there are seats available, I always recommend people move forward. We've also noticed an average of about 10 to 15 points difference between sitting in the back of the room and sitting in the front of the room. It's correlation, not causation, but keep it in mind. Okay? All right, so welcome to PHY 3333, CFB 3333, KNW 2333, Introduction to the Scientific Method. We have a lot to do today, and we'll begin with some introductions here in a moment, but we wanted to welcome all of you to the course. We promise you it will be an entertaining and very dense semester. Okay? So we have a lot of stuff to do today. This is the big first day to-do list. So let's start by going through our background information. So I will pass the microphone awkwardly to John. There you go. Have fun. Yeah, this is a little bit of a scramble here. We, we, if everything works out, we'll have two wireless microphones fairly soon and we won't have to do this. Uh, anyway, one thing you might ask, somebody always does, is why are there two of us? It's very unusual you will find a class that is taught by two instructors who are here every time, unless, like Steve's at CERN doing research. Nearly every yeah. time. Yeah. But essentially we're here all the time. The reason is, <laughs> let's be honest, if the workload of this course is so great that one person would be overwhelmed. That's essentially it. Uh, also, you get two different takes on things, which you'll understand here in a moment. But that's, there, there's reasons why there's two of us, and the primary one is the paper grading load gets so huge that one person gets overwhelmed. Uh, now, me, background, you want to find out who we are. Uh, one, I've been doing this course, this is starting... Finishing the 11th year yeah. of doing this. We've been doing this for quite a while. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun. My background is, if you go back and look at transcripts, is engineering. So I've always said, if you, I'm a generalist at this point because I've studied and done so many different things uh, that I never could specialize in one. So I consider myself as a generalist, but if you scratch deep enough, you'll find an engineer. Uh, and that means I have a a particular way of approaching problems and of dealing with things because again my background is what I call it unlike a PhD which is a foot wide and a mile deep my background is a mile wide and a foot deep so they're, they're, very, they're very, very different people also as you might be able to tell I'm a little older than Steve <laughs> anyway not for long uh, no, you'll catch up <laughs> just give them time uh, but anyway the difference in background and uh, the, the uh, Necessity for two is why there's two of us, and you'll find you'll find this out as you go along. Yeah. So as John said, um, in contrast to his being a mile wide and a foot deep, I guess I'm more a uh, mile deep and a foot wide. So uh, this is me on the right, just in case you're not clear. All right, I'm Professor Stephen Sakula. I am a member of the physics faculty here as well. I spend my bulk of my time doing research, and my research is focused on studying the origin of the cosmos, the laws that govern the structure of the cosmos, and the hopes of understanding the whole thing from the beginning to its eventual end. Um, we, I do this using a massive subatomic particle collider located at the CERN laboratory you know, just outside Geneva, Switzerland. That does mean that I'll be doing uh, some traveling this semester, so I apologize in advance. I'll try to let everybody know about my travel schedule, but there will always be somebody on call to help you out if you have questions. Um, so that's, uh, that's the bottom line. The thing in the background here is the piece of equipment that I get to use for my research. This is about two meters wide here that you're seeing, and this thing goes for half a football field in length, and it's about 10 stories tall. So this is in a cavern about 150 meters under the ground. And uh, to get there, you take an elevator ride. The, one of the days I took a tour of my own experiment, the elevator broke. And so they had to hold us down there for an extra long time. Uh, it happens. That's life. So 
There's no stairway. There's, well, there is a stairway, but no one wants to walk 150 meters vertical. So, yeah. Okay, so next thing on the to-do list is about you. So one of the things that we're going to need you to do is to invent a code name for yourself. Okay, so let me explain. We're going to use this for uh, gathering information for uh, a, a, a survey that we're going to do. Now, do not use your actual name, including your middle name. You want nothing personally identifiable about yourself in the code name. Uh, it's okay if you use a nickname, but you really want to make sure nobody else in the room knows that nickname. So, for instance, Pretty Pony. Okay, if I were to choose a, a code name for myself, you'd never guess that I would pick that. Now, that means nobody gets to use that now. No one gets to be Pretty Pony. Okay. So, your, think, of, think for a moment, focus on what your code name is going to be, and you're going to put that code name at the top of the survey that's being handed around. Okay, and if we happen for some mysterious reason to get two code names or, that are the same, we'll try to figure out who did that, and then we'll make one of you choose a different code name. Okay? We'll toss, we will toss a coin to decide which one gets to change. So right. It's fair. Right. Coin toss. That's a nice fair. And we promise you it's an unbiased coin. It doesn't always come up heads or something like that. So what you're getting now is something called the survey of beliefs. It's on a scale of one to five, where five is you strongly agree with the statement, okay, and one is you strongly disagree with the statement, you strongly disagree with the statement. Now, uh, zero would mean it's absolutely false, and six would mean it's absolutely true, but we cannot prove anything is absolutely true or absolutely false in life, okay? We can only say what the weight of the evidence is. So five is you believe strongly that the statement is true, one is that you believe strongly that it is not true. That's the strongest belief anybody can have. Okay, well, I walked around and noticed that people were about typically halfway through or more through the survey. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to sort of an interactive portion of the lecture here. And I apologize to the people in the front. Or not. No. That's the one. So... Why do I need this course? Um, believe it or not, you live in a culture or you're studying in a country uh, where there are a lot of interesting beliefs out there. And many of those beliefs can be assessed critically using the scientific method because they make claims that are actually testable about the natural world, even though the claims themselves may sound like they exceed the confines of the natural world, they can be tested. Okay, so for instance, uh, this is something we'll do in the course, and we'll talk a bit more about this in this lecture. About 28% uh, of Americans believe in something called astrology. This is the belief that where the stars are located in the sky on the day of your birth, maybe even at the moment of your birth, can be important in this case, determines you, who you are. It determines your personality. It determines the events of your day-to-day -day life. You can pick up just about any paper, legitimate or otherwise, and find a horoscope section. And so if you're interested, if you know what day you were born on, which I hope you do, then you can look that up and you can find out what your horoscope is. And this is based on astrology, which is this claim that the positions of the stars on the day you were born affect you. They change who you are. 18% uh, of Americans aren't sure whether or not they believe in it. So if you add those numbers together, you're getting to about 50% of Americans who either believe in this or they're not sure. They don't know whether it's true or not. Okay? 60% of Americans believe in extrasensory perception, or ESP, that there's some kind of sixth sense. Uh, we're in psychokinetic powers, that the power of the mind can be used to move physical objects or read people's thoughts. 30% uh, believe that we've been visited by extraterrestrials. 25 to 50%, it kind of depends on how you frame the question, believe in ghosts, uh, in faith healing and communication with the dead and lucky numbers. Now, that might sound like something that is outside the realms of your ability to test it, but in fact there are many specific claims made about ghosts, about faith healing, that can be critically assessed and tested. And it's this course where we hope to give you the toolkit that you need in order to make those kinds of assessments. And we will expect you to make those kinds of assessments through the, through the class, okay? You're entitled to your beliefs. I have beliefs that sometimes seem a little cockamamie in the face of the fact that I'm also a scientist. Nonetheless, I don't let my science life cross into my belief life. In this class, you'll learn to assess exactly why you and others believe what you believe. Because why you believe what you believe is as important as what you believe. Alright? This is really critical, because firm beliefs can be totally wrong 
And that may seem harmless sometimes, depends on the belief, but they can kill. And I'll give you some examples of this. Okay? Now, something I want to make you aware of. I am priming you. There is a psychological phenomenon, actually two related psychological phenomena, cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias. Cognitive dissonance is an emotional response, fear, panic, anger, dread. When you receive information that conflicts with your established set of beliefs, that's cognitive dissonance. It feels like your brain's being severed in half and your heart feels like it tightens up and maybe you get a little nauseous. Okay? We all have this biological response because we process information so that we can survive. And when we are presented with information that conflicts with prior beliefs, it can cause real problems physically. Okay? You may experience this during this class. Don't freak out. It's normal. Related to this is confirmation bias. To avoid the feeling of cognitive dissonance, one strategy that humans have is to avoid evidence that conflicts with their beliefs. So maybe you only read a certain news site because you agree with the political bend of that site. And if you read a, 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 another news site with an alternative political bend, you get very angry, and you don't like getting angry, so you only pick up the confirming evidence, and you ignore the disconfirming evidence. That's confirmation bias. Again, a well-documented psychological phenomenon. It's a coping mechanism we have as living beings. All right. So, because we know that humans do this, I'm human, you're human, we think he's human, <laughs> look at that shirt, okay? All right, you have to fight your fear. You will feel fear. You will feel nausea and dread at some of the things you're going to see in this class, I know, and some of you are like, what? This is supposed to be about the scientific method, but there are parts of this class where even I haven't gotten used to seeing some of it, and I'm an instructor in the course. All right? So it's okay. Other people in the room are probably feeling it. Get your emotions in check. Remember your training. It will save you. Remember the toolkit we give you. Okay? Uh, you're going to have to really fight the, in, the instinct, and you will have this instinct, to refuse to believe something simply because it conflicts with pre-existing beliefs that may have been placed there by teachers, parents, friends, loved ones, religious authorities, whatever. Okay? You, again, the the purpose of this course is to assess why people claim what they claim. All, right? All that matters in science is the evidence for the claim, the quality of the evidence, and whether or not the claim can be openly and critically assessed. The minute you pull back from any of those, you have now exited the scientific realm. And don't expect science to have anything nice to say, okay? Because it can't be assessed anymore if you close up. So you have to be willing to be open, but not so open that your brains fall out. That's the trick in science. Keep an open mind, okay, but don't accept everything that comes across your plate. Learn to critically assess information. Learn. We want you to become an information consumer. Learn early on that I don't know is a perfectly good answer. If, some, if something comes up, you, it's perfectly fine to say, I don't know. And it's also important in a way of thinking to understand that the fact that you have not seen or heard of something, which will happen all the time, you've never heard of that, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And it doesn't mean that even if it exists, it's not true. Yeah. So if somebody tells me, I never heard of that, I accept that as a statement of fact. You never heard of it. But that's as far as I'm going to let it go. We cannot interpret that to mean it's not true. All right. That's another thing to keep, to keep in mind. It's fine to say, I don't know. I say, I don't know, to the graduate students that I work with probably two to three times a day. All right? And it's shocking to them. They come into my office expecting me to have all the answers. But if I had all the answers, why would I do science? Science is about finding answers, not knowing answers. It's not about facts. It's about the methodology for establishing facts. Okay. And so when my graduate students come in and say, hey, I have a question, why does this do that? And I say, I don't know. And they look at me like I've just landed from the planet Mars, and the, who are you, and why are you being paid to do this? If I knew everything, I would take this microphone off, and I would just go make a billion dollars. Okay? I don't. And I like finding things out. And part of that, a critical part of that, is admitting I don't know. That is the start of all learning. So thank you for, for making that point. That's excellent.
Uh, okay, yeah, so we can, uh, if you're done with the surveys, please pass them down to the person at the end of your row over by the aisle side. Okay, and they will be picked up. And uh, now that we're freeing you uh, to participate a bit more, what I want you to do is pick up your flashcards. Okay? So this is, the, this is the class participation exercise we'll do today. Now I'm going to have some poll uh, statements or questions. There are three choices, A, B, C, if we take these cards apart. You can see there's an A, a blue B, and a pink C. All right? Now I want this to be a private poll. I want you to feel like you're not under any peer pressure, okay, and that you're not being judged by your peers. So here's how we're going to do the poll. I'm just going to pick a random answer. And I'm gonna pick, see. So let's say I, I put my cards down all right, in front of me. I shuffle them until I get to the one that I'm interested in answering. Cover them up with my hands. And then I simply box them like this. And then hold it up to my chin. Okay. So all I want you to do is pick the card you think is your best answer to this question. Okay. Uh, this, is the, this is what I want you to tell me. AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. What's it caused by? Is it caused by a person's behavior? A. Is it caused by an invasive virus? B. Is it caused by divine punishment? C. And what are you doing? <laughs> Put your camera phone away. This is about class etiquette. Mr. Pink, if that's your name. All right, so let's go ahead and, and all go ahead and poll. All right, so take a few seconds to do this. What do people think the correct answer is in their view? Okay. You can hide it from your peers so there's no pressure. Okay, thanks. You can put them all down now. Thank you. All right, so uh, I saw a whole lot of B. All right, so scientifically, the correct answer is B. AIDS is caused by an invasive virus. All right, so the scientific con consensus unequivocally is that AIDS is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. But there are people in the world who have had influence on other people in the world who reject this idea. They reject the scientific explanation of AIDS. One of these people is a professor at UC Berkeley named Peter Duisberg, actually a professor of you know, biological sciences. So this is not somebody you can claim out as a philosopher or a history professor is just a nutball. Okay? It's actually somebody who ought to know how to critically assess scientific evidence. Okay? Now, Peter by himself might be harmless, but he has followers, uh, including, I haven't listed this here, but including President Thabo Mbeki of South Africa, who changed AIDS policy in South Africa in response to Duisberg's claim that HIV is not the cause of the problem. And this caused mass outbreaks of AIDS in South Africa compared to neighboring countries that had instituted policies to deal with the HIV problem. Okay? One of the other people that's a famous follower of Duisberg's cause is a woman named Christine Maggiore. She's pictured here on this cover of this Mothering magazine. She again rejects the HIV hypothesis that HIV is the cause of, of, AIDS, of AIDS, well, really the HIV theory, because it's been established by multiple lines of evidence now. So she followed his teachings, and she refused to take the antiretroviral drugs that would prevent, in large part, transmission of HIV through the placenta to her infant children. And so she had two children. One of them was named Eliza Jane. She's pictured here around age two or three. And she died at age three of HIV, of AIDS, induced by HIV. Okay? So, pseudoscience, that is the rejection of science or the, or the twisting of scientific uh, structure to suit a belief system can have devastating consequences. In this case, it killed a child and eventually it killed Christine herself. She died of AIDS-related complications in 2008. Okay? So, pseudoscience can kill. I have a question. Yeah. That Peter's guy, is he just a blogger? Like... Peter's Duesberg? No, no, he's a published scientist. His ideas have uh, been debated heavily in the scientific community and thoroughly run against the evidence that's out there. I mean, he can see, he's published on the subject. You can find his publications. If you find this to be a, an interesting topic for a research paper, come and talk to us about it. There's tons of resources, both sources of the claim, including papers and books that he's published, and then uh, scientific evidence assessing the claim, but also assessing uh, other things like HIV itself. All right, so Duisberg's claim is that drug addiction lowers your immune response, and that's what causes AIDS, not HIV. HIV is just opportunistic. It happens to get in there when you abuse drugs. But then what about babies that are born to women who didn't abuse drugs but had HIV? So you can already start to pick that claim apart very quickly, right? So there's a wealth of stuff out there, both for the claim and against the claim. And if you're going to write a research paper for this course, which you will, you'll write two, 
you would have to assess evidence for the claim, evidence against the claim, and tell us what the weight of the evidence is for or against the claim. Okay? Claim assessment. That's going to be at the heart of this course. All right, so that's a great question. So, no, he's a scientist. I mean, he's like me or that he's guy. Done good work. <laughs> he, he does some good work. He's done some area. good work. Yeah, and that's what makes this dangerous. Okay, another great example. Linus Pauling, Nobel Prize winner in physics and chemistry, held the belief that vitamin C megadoses can cure all kinds of problems. There is no scientific evidence that vitamin C megadoses do anything but make your pee very expensive and possibly lead to a vitamin C overdose, which can make you sick, okay? Linus Pauling, Nobel Prize winner, held this belief. Lots of other stuff he did totally legitimate. That cockamamie, all right? No evidence to back up the claim whatsoever. So this happens, okay? So you really have to ask, why does somebody believe what they believe? And even credentialed people can say the most outlandish things. In fact, that's when you're most at risk. When somebody credentialed in the area is speaking about a subject, that's when you drop your defenses. And that is probably when you most need to stop and think, wait, toolkit, what's the weight of the evidence? What do the publications say? Is this a minority claim? And how should it be assessed? Uh, okay, scientifically. So that's a, this is all good stuff, okay? All right, so another class poll. All right, so here we go. What is chiropractic medicine? A, a practice of manipulating the body that resulted from decades of good research on par with the best modern medicine. B, an ancient form of Chinese medicine based on the presence of 365 meridians in the human body, one for each day of the year. Or C, invented by a grocer in Iowa, it is no better than doing nothing and rejects the germ theory of disease. So, think about that for a second, okay? And again, secret poll. So, cup, cup the cards in your hand. All right, and then raise them up when you think you have your answer, okay? Okay, we'll go another few seconds here. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. So I see a lot of A, a lot of B, and some C. This is great. This is, this is exactly what I wanted to... Uh, what's up? Oh. <laughs> well, it was about... I'd say it was about 50-50, uh, A and B, for the, those that answered A and B, roughly. Okay? All right, so A is a practice of manipulating the body that resulted from decades of good research on par with the best medicine. B is an ancient form of Chinese medicine, and C is invented by a grocer. The answer is C. It was invented by a grocer. Uh, it is actually no better than doing the nothing based on now a long history of scientific study of chiropractic, and it rejects the germ theory of disease. Chiropractors were overwhelmingly against the March of Dimes, which was the cause to raise money for polio vaccination. Okay? Because they believed that chiropractic was all you needed to cure polio, which cripples and maims and kills, and it's caused by a virus. Okay? So, uh, pseudoscience can kill here too. The science unequivocally says that medical problems result from biological and chemical origins, and the germ theory of disease unites these to explain how invasive organisms or how, uh, for instance, genetic traits handed down from generation to generation can cause disease in the body, okay? Chiropractic medicine claims that disease is caused by bones uh, being misaligned and, and interrupting the flow of nerve energy in the body. And the nerve energy can't be detected, and the displacements often can only be detected by a trained chiropractor, so goes the claim. So they won't show up on x-rays. X-rays can detect displacements at the size of what? a few atoms, if you really wanted to be precise about it. Okay, so how can uh, something that's displaced by a few atoms cause all the disease we know being humankind? Okay, so that's the chiropractic claim. And the result of this uh, is that most chiropractors actually have no medical training. They're not medical doctors. There are medical doctors that have degrees in chiropractic. Okay? They wise up. Uh, but what's that? They wise up. Yeah, that, I mean, so that, that, you know, that's a bit safer to go to. If you had to go to a chiropractor, that would be a better choice. But they uh, overwhelmingly, about 60%, reject vaccination to prevent disease because they think all you need is a routine adjustment and you don't need all these vaccinations to prevent polio and measles and mumps and rubella and chicken pox and the flu and all that stuff. They actually believe they can cure the common cold with adjustment of your back. Okay? There are famous examples of people suffering stroke or paralysis from neck manipulation. So we'll have a chiropractor come in and demonstrate this for you when we talk about alternative medicine. You'll see this and what it looks like and what it sounds like. Uh, one of the more recent examples that was famous for my generation, not for yours, but this uh, very handsome, beefy actor named Kevin Sorbo played Hercules and was in a sci-fi TV show in the late 90s and early 2000s. 
and he regularly went to a chiropractor, and after one neck adjustment, he suffered three strokes in rapid succession in his car in the parking lot. And that's because the, neck, the strain of having your neck snap can actually puncture one of the main uh, blood vessels in your body and start causing you to bleed out because it, it winds through bone to get to your brain. So when you jerk the bone, it can tear the blood vessel and you can stroke out within minutes. Okay? So there's a lot of evidence now accumulated that the risk of stroke and other things like paralysis go up with chiropractic manipulation of the most severe kind. Chiropractic, when compared to massage, works just as well on things that can be treated with massage. But if you're talking about the common cold or flu or uh, things like that, it's not any better than doing nothing at all, which is called the placebo effect, and we'll talk about that later in the course. Yeah, another question. Yeah, another where question. did you get your, the second bullet point, or where did you make that point? Ah, there was uh, actually a couple of chiropractors decided, uh, they, 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 had, uh, they believed in vaccination, and they were worried, they didn't know how many of their colleagues actually still rejected the, the germ theory of disease and vaccination, so they actually conducted a poll in the early 2000s uh, of chiropractors. So they got a sample of chiropractors to respond to their poll. And of the ones that responded, about 60% of them said they don't recommend vaccinations for their patients at all, nor for their own families. So that's fairly recent data. It's within the last 10 years. Now, I'm sure it's changed. The question is whether it's gone up or down. I don't know. But I'm sure it's changed. So that's fairly recent data. Okay, so if you go to our lecture on alternative medicine, either in the slides uh, or in the notes, there should be a link to that paper. And if it's not, I'll, I'll put it there. It was in my slides, uh, introduction slides from two semesters ago. Okay, another class poll. All right, so vaccines are known through multiple research studies to A, prevent illnesses that once killed or maimed major fractions of the human population with negligible negative side effects. B, prevent illnesses that once killed or maimed major fractions of the human population but also cause huge modern problems like autism, and C, be ineffective against diseases that affect the human population, having only negative side effects with no benefit to the population, okay? So think about that for a moment, and let's do the poll. And again, cup and hold, cup and hold. Hold them up for a few more seconds. Okay, John? Yeah. Okay. So I counted about six or seven Bs, and the yeah. rest all seemed yeah. to be yeah. A's. Okay. Okay, so, so there were, uh, uh, most of them were A. Okay, so the prevents illness, negligible negative side effects, and B. Uh, was about seven, six or seven people, and that was uh, that it does those things, but it also causes huge modern problems like autism. Okay, so the scientific answer is that vaccinations prevent disease. Okay, so that's that's true. And vaccinated people then go on to protect the unvaccinated. For instance, people that are immunocompromised and can't get vaccines, they could die if they get a vaccine. But they're protected by herd immunity. That is, you get a vaccine and I get a vaccine, and our friend who's immunocompromised is prevented from getting the disease by us not transmitting it, okay? There is actually no evidence whatsoever, no scientific evidence, that things like autism are caused by vaccines or the things that are used to preserve vaccines for transport. All right, that's the scientific evidence. Now, there are, uh, there's one person who's essentially responsible for the modern claim that vaccines cause autism, and it was based on a study of about a dozen sick kids in a British hospital. It was done by Andrew Wakefield, and it was published about uh, just over a decade ago. And it was retracted from the journal about five years ago that it was originally published in because it had been so thoroughly discredited, both that he had taken money uh, to uh, basically for a treatment that would be an alternative to vaccines or other things, uh, that he had faked data and that he had used small statistics and misinterpreted the results of the data and so forth. It was a mess. And he did not have proper permissions from the patients. Oh, yeah, and that he actually didn't have proper permissions from the patients who were kids, so permission from their parents to conduct the study in the first place. Every so just every possible line you could cross, he crossed. And a monetary conflict of interest because he was going to sell. Yeah. He, he had a patent. Oh, yeah, you know, that's what I said. Yeah, that he was yeah. going to sell. If he could get the original one, take it off the market legally. He right. had a plan. He was going to get rich on it. Right. So the problem is that this claim, because it got published and then got advertised widely in the public media, made it into the public consciousness as being real. Even though Wakefield's study is the only one that shows this link, 
and 14 independent peer-reviewed studies with much larger samples have shown no link whatsoever between vaccines and autism. Autism does seem to be related to other factors, but not to vaccines themselves. We should so, note yeah. that the Lancet, which the Lan by the way, it was published in the Lancet, which right. is the British medical journal, uh, they said if they had known at the time of publication of the conflict of interest, financial interest that he had, everything else, they'd never have published the paper. He would, in violation of policy, he withheld all of that when he sent him the paper. He didn't tell them. Yeah, so it was bad ethics and, and bad science. science. So, oh, Randy, could you grab that survey? It was bad in every okay. way. So the, the consequences of this, um, this has been in the news recently. This is Jenny McCarthy. She's now uh, supposed to be co-hosting The View. And uh, she is an avid follower of Wakefield, and she has claimed that her son was born with autism, and it was diagnosed, and then she put him on a special diet, and his autism went away. And she claimed that vaccines caused that autism in the first place. Uh, it's impossible to know actually what her son's condition was, because medical records are private, and they should be. But that means that you have to wonder, like, was he just misdiagnosed or something like that? There is no evidence that diet makes autism better. All right, so for people that have actually been genuinely diagnosed with autism, diet doesn't really make a difference. But the problem is that she leads organizations now that go out and tell people not to vaccinate their kids. And that's bad because, as is in the news recently, there's been an outbreak of, is it uh, pertussis here in Texas? Measles here in Texas that was spread by unvaccinated people, okay? So, and these are people that consciously chose not to get vaccinated. It wasn't just that they didn't have access to vaccines. They explicitly refused to be vaccinated for this in the first place or to vaccinate their kids. They were told okay. by their reverend. Right. In this case, they were told by a religious authority figure that they shouldn't vaccinate. Okay. So again, you just want to stop and ask, wait, what's the evidence for that claim? And is there, you know, I have to weigh personal choice and other things, and we'll get into different kinds of controversies in this class. You have to weigh certain factors in your life. But then you have to ask, what's the benefit and what's the science state, okay? And what's the risk? And what's the risk of not doing it? Well, measles is too. not pretty. You don't just break out in little bumps. I mean, you can, your skin can look, you can look like an X-Man character uh, in the most severe cases, and it can kill. Okay, measles is not fun. Chicken pox is not fun if you get a severe case of it, all right? Okay, so there's lots more examples on the web. You can go ahead and click on this link and, 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 and uh, read through them at your heart's terrific consent, uh, content. All right. So let's move on to course information and requirements. So we want you to be able to detect potentially fraudulent claims, okay? And so that's what this course is for. So again, welcome, all right? Now the uh, first thing, goals, all right? So I've kind of said this over and over and over already. We want to provide you with an understanding of the scientific method that is sufficient to then be able to detect all kinds of scams and frauds and deception bad science and anti-science and every, I mean, everything, okay? So, paranormal phenomena, free energy devices, alternative medicine claims, intelligent design creationism, denial of human-induced climate change, uh, science-based medicine denialism, misuse of data and statistics, so if you're a business major or an advertising major, there's something in here for you. We got propaganda, we're going to talk about propaganda, how it's conducted, different types. Who wrote the book on it? You'll love to find that out, okay? Who wrote the book on propaganda? Uh, these are all the things that are used by advertisers and businesses and politicians and so forth to get you to have an emotional response so that you can bypass your brain. And we want to teach you to detect it, stop, and think. Okay? Your writing is going to improve in this class. Um, I would wager that the majority of you have never actually written a research paper where you have to go and read primary sources and then assess the statements made about the quality of the data and the conclusions on the data. This is a hard process. You should come and talk to us as early as you can about what's expected. We have examples of good papers. You should look at those. So we'll start giving the information out about how you can access that as we go forward. Okay? Uh, etiquette. Just a few notes. Uh, be on time to class. I know that's not always possible for everybody if you have closed class changes. But please understand that we give the quizzes out for attendance at 11 a.m. sharp. If you're late, that gives you less time to work on the quiz. And if you miss the quiz entirely, you get a zero for the quiz, but we will count your attendance, and I'll come to the attendance policy in a moment. In class, please turn off your mobile device ringer alert alarm. If you have somewhere more important to be, go be there, okay? Understand, as you'll see from the absence policy, that that will count against you, but it's cumulative, and you can always choose not to come to class. But if you really have something more important to do when you're waiting for that call to come through, just stay out. Let the learning environment be you know, preserved for everybody else. 
Uh, computers are a fine modern tool for doing things like taking notes and, and, and participating in ongoing course activities, but if you're using them to Facebook, to Tweet, to Instagram, to Vine, to Snapchat, or anything else, then if we spot that, and we will walk around and look, you and your computer have just volunteered to help us look up information for the rest of the class. So get your Google fingers out, because you're going to be Wikipediaing and Googling for us through the rest of the class. You've been warned, all right? Again, if you have something more interesting to do, go do it. Come here to participate in class. No casual conversation during class, even after you finish your quiz. This happens a lot. If you think you're being quiet enough, you're not. It's not that big a classroom. I know it's hard to hear in the back, but trust me, everyone hears you. And uh, we want you to participate in discussion and respect your peers and your instructors, and of course, we'll respect you in return. Okay, grades. Uh, there's a lot more detail on the web, but the basic idea is that attendance and participation in class is 5%. I'll come back to attendance in a moment. Uh, homework assignments, there are six of these still for the semester, okay? And abstracts, you have to write two abstracts, one for each of your proposed research papers. Those count a total of 10%, and we drop the lowest. Reading quizzes, these are given every day in class at the beginning of class at 11 a.m. sharp. The cumulative portion of your grade for those is 10%. We drop the lowest one. Uh, book report one and two, this is you. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, book review. So this is actually reviewing a book or a magazine article or something. There's a whole list of things you can choose from. Uh, we want you to review it as if you're writing a New York Times book review about this thing, okay? Those are each 10%. You then have a seven-page research paper and a 15-page research paper. Now, the, 50, the, the first paper is due around midterm. I'd strongly recommend you do the 15-page paper first so that you don't then have a 15-page paper to write at the end of the semester when you are busy. You say that again. I strongly recommend that you write the 15-page paper first so that you don't have a 15-page paper to write at the end of the semester. There's another reason for that. The 15-page paper is 20% of your grade, and you get to rewrite the midterm paper for a better grade. Wouldn't you rather rewrite the big paper in the middle that's worth more than the tiny paper in the middle that's worth less? It's up to you, okay? You know your schedules better than we do, but I'm just trying to make you be a wise consumer here, all right? Final exam in, uh, in this room in December. The date should be posted on the syllabus, 20% of the grade, okay? And that'll be a survey across all the things we cover in the class. I should mention one detail about reading quizzes, since normally, if you have a homework assignment, that's due on Fridays. We always try to plan to see your homework come in on Friday. Right. So there is no reading assignment for Friday because you're doing a homework. So on Friday we'll do something else that'll look like the reading quizzes, but it's poll or opinion. Yeah, it's, atten it's meant to take attendance. Yeah, it's just to find out who's here. Yeah, so Fridays when homework are due, you won't have a reading quiz on that Friday. Okay. There so may be an exception, but it will be in the syllabus if we have no homework. Yeah. So we have, again, we have this website, all right? Uh, you have the URL on the printout there. Go to that, click on syllabus if it's not already printed out. It's evolving. We have uh, basically the lectures up to about fall break are determined. All right? Um, extra credit, we don't give it. Don't ask. That's our first rule. Our second rule, if we choose to give it, and it's our prerogative, it's offered as an equal opportunity extra credit to everybody in the classroom. These are rare. Now, I'm going to alter this deal a little bit this semester. You have these flashcards. You have them, keep them, love them, bring them to class. We would love to conduct more polls. This is very helpful for us, okay? So we can do a little uh, rapid response teaching as we go here. So the way we will enforce you, loving these things and taking care of them like a, like a, you know, like a newborn chick, is that we'll give you extra credit. Occasionally we'll ask you to, to uh, uh, paper clip the cards to the reading quiz, so keep the paper clip you got. It's free on the physics department, all right? Um, you, can, you can contact Fred Olness and thank him for that. Um, you get one point extra credit on the quiz. Each quiz is worth two points. That's 50%. Okay. Now, attendance. Attendance is a part of your final grade. It's checked via these attendance quizzes or reading quizzes. Basically, you show up, you put your name on the quiz, you attend it. Okay? If you leave lecture after taking the quiz, we have eyes, four of them actually, and we'll notice. And we get to learn your names fairly quickly in this class, Anthony. And so as a result of that, what's going to happen is we're going to see you leave before the end of class, and we're going to ding you for attendance. That doesn't count as attending, okay? Now, if you have something you need to get to, let us know. Let us know you might leave early that day, maybe whatever you need to leave, okay? Talk to us. We prefer information over a lack of information because we have to interpret a lack of information, and 
We're not going to interpret it nicely, right? You're allowed six, six unexcused absences, six, over the entire semester. Six unexcused absences. I can't say that enough. Six. As of the seventh, you automatically failed the course, and here's why. The data tells us that the more classes you miss, the worse you do, the faster you move to failing in the course. You're going to fail anyway if you miss seven classes. So we're just enforcing that behavior numerically. Okay? No pleading, no whining, no buts. Excused absences do not count as part of your six unexcused. So if you have a sporting event, a religious exception, whatever, bring the paperwork to us in advance of the absence so that we know not to ding you for that. Okay? Again, talk to us. And a university sanctioned sponsored activity. Yes, university is sanctioned excused. sponsored activity excused. So if you are, as I like to say, if you happen to be a member of the SMU Squirrel Chasing Team right. and you're having a competition, you and it's fierce with UT this year. I mean, squirrel chasing has never been fiercer. From the sponsor, everybody will know you know how to right. do this, and they'll have a copy for us and just make sure we get it. That guy wants to talk. Yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah, so why don't we hand out these uh, attendance quizzes, and I'll just go on here. There's this short and easy stuff. This is the oh, sorry, astrology. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about that. So we are going to have a trained astrologer. Uh, it's like a family friend of Dr. Scalise's or something like that. Yeah, sister-in-law. Okay. She's going to do an astrological reading. So here, you need to invent a code number. Okay. Uh, oh, this is the code name? Sorry, code name. Okay, so use your code name on this. Uh, we don't want you to use any information that might be used to look you up on something like Facebook or Google and then get personal information about you that can be folded into the astrological reading. We want this to be done using only the information astrologers claim that they need, and that is your birth information. Okay? So fill that out in, I don't know, a few weeks or something like that. We'll get readings back for each one of you. It takes time to do 65 of these things, or 64. Uh, and then we'll go through those in class, and we'll see how accurate they are. Okay? Okay, one more thing. This is going to be, when you finish the astrology, basic data. Right. And here, you're going to need a code number. This is different from a code name. It is four digits, up to four digits. Four digits. And don't use any part of your driver's license number, your SSN, or anything else. Just make up something neat. Nothing personally identifiable. Sure. No birthday, no bank account, credit card number, nothing. There's a reason for this. We post grade summaries online on the website. And this number is what we're going to use because the university really doesn't want to choose anything else. It must be a random number that you invent. Right. This because, is approved. And if you don't have a code number, we can't put your grade summaries on the on the website or it'll be at the top of the blank and you can't pick out which is yours. Right. So, so non-personally identifiable four-digit random number, memorize it. Write it down in your notebook someplace. You're going to need that for the whole class. Okay, so write that number down. Okay, so while that's going on, let me just talk about plagiarism, okay? Plagiarism is a super serious issue in this class. Until last semester, we had gone 19 consecutive semesters with at least one instance of plagiarism in each semester that we detected, and we've gotten very good because, surprise, surprise, the teachers who teach you how to detect scams, lies, and frauds are very good at detecting scams, lies, and frauds. Not perfect. You can test us if you'd like, but it uh, hasn't gone well for people. And here's what happens. If you copy from your neighbor's quiz, you're plagiarizing. If you steal a paper from any source, any, any interpretation of, of something from any source, and you don't cite the source, theft, plagiarism. Using sentences, figures, tables, ideas without citing the source, plagiarism. We minimally reward such misbehavior with an F in the course. Minimally reward plagiarism with an F in the course. And then, as a bonus, cherry on top of that, cake of crap, we additionally reward such behavior by filing academic violation paperwork. Two of those on file, you go before the academic council, and they are the honors council, and they're way meaner than us. And we will file on every case, every provable case of plagiarism. Yeah, if we have evidence, it goes. Okay? So don't, 
do it because then you're just making evidence for us. All right. So please, if you're struggling, if you're struggling and you're tempted to cheat, come and talk to us. Wipe that thought from your mind and talk to us. All right. And we'll send information out about office hours and whatnot over the next day or so. And one other caution. One other thing. Oh, don't shuffle. Don't shuffle. Which we'll say early on, and that's about taking a paper from somebody else. We have had cases where. A student has gotten a paper from this course from a prior student in the class a year or two earlier and turned it in just by changing the name on the paper. Uh, the service we use to text this, uh, and, including uh, drafts. And in case you're not familiar with the honor code, which you should be, uh, the person who supplied the paper will also be filed on for an honor violation. If they're still in so, if they're still But here. if they're not, we'll detect you and you'll get screwed, and that's all that really matters yeah. in so an the, honor violation. The key so. is while you're here to protect yourself. And I mean protect yourself from an honor violation. Yeah, don't let people never, steal papers from you. Ever, never give anybody a machine-readable copy of your work. Never give them a, a thumb drive, never email. Do not let anybody else ever have a copy of a file of a paper you've written. That's for your own protection, because if that person takes it, you have no control over what they're going to do with it. And in many cases, the reason they want it is they're behind on the assignment and they've got to turn it in tomorrow and they'll just change the name on the paper and hand it in and then you are on the line as well. And it doesn't take much for the software to raise red flags for us. Yeah, please. Okay. That's for your own protection. In addition, there, we've had papers that people have handed in that, uh, that actually didn't raise any red flags from the software but we could just look at them and know that that student had not written them. Mm -hmm. And when confronted, the student confessed because they got the paper from a paper mill. So we're not stupid, okay? We know how to read and we know from your work what your level of, of, uh, of uh, potential is, let's say. And if we see you over exceeding that, that's a statistical outlier, you'll learn about those. And we ding like a bell. That really sets off red flags for us, okay? So go ahead, you can try, but there's no guarantee that we won't detect it. I just recommend you come and talk to us. Our doors are open, talk to us. Hand those uh, quizzes back down and you're free. We'll see you on Wednesday.